Well, I thought I'd introduce this talk and this passage by looking at the last line of the first verse of Amazing Grace. This well-known hymn was written by John Newton, who was born in London in 1725. He was the son of a sailor. His mum died when he was a mere seven years old. And he first went to sea with his father, aged 11, got the bug for seafaring and went on to become a captain of ships himself. Uh, slave ships in particular, scouting the African coast for human cargo and bringing them back via the West Indies to England. Now in 1748, he and his men were caught in a storm on a return voyage to England on board the ship, the Greyhound. The storm was ferocious and as the sailors fought for their lives, Newton prayed to God. First time he'd done that in many a year. He prayed that God would save him, and he did. And from that moment on, even before Newton arrived back in England, he began to read his Bible and look at Christianity seriously for the first time in a long, long time. And then he attributes his conversion to the 10th of March, 1748, and apparently he celebrated that every year thereafter. Now, years later, he went on to write arguably the most famous hymn in all of history, and those very familiar words, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. But now I see. So those last four words I want to draw your attention to. Have you ever asked yourself what did Newton mean by, but now I see? What did he see exactly? What did he mean by those words? Well, of course, he was tapping into a theme that's used multiple times in the Bible. That is seeing the truth, having God open your eyes to see things from his perspective perspective, having your spiritually blind eyes open for the first time. His conversion was the opening of his eyes to the things of God, just like being in a dark room all your life and having a light bulb switched on for the first time, or like having impaired vision and looking through glasses for the very first time. When you become a Christian, you begin to see God differently, Jesus differently, the world, money, family, values, all of life differently. But as you begin to understand the gospel, it not only changes what you see, but also changes what you do and why you want to do it. John Newton not only saw things differently, but then he went on to do things differently. He left the slave trade, became an Anglican minister, and then became an ally of William Wilberforce to help kickstart the abolition of slavery. 1 Corinthians is all about how the Christian, having had their blind eyes opened by the amazing grace of God, should go on likewise to not only see the world differently, but live in the world differently. However, the Corinthians were allowing the cultural clouds of Corinth to come back and obscure their newfound understanding of the world and of each other. Their culture of competitiveness, boasting, classism, was distorting their newfound vision. It was blurring their understanding of what was truly spiritual and clouding their thinking on what church should do and be like. Something I think we're all susceptible to. So Paul wrote this letter to brush away the clouds that were distorting their understanding of the gospel and all its implications. And here in this section, Paul says that one of the things you as a Christian must clearly see are that your gifts have been given to you by God. And he wants us to see how to use them. The gospel ought to change how you see and use your God-given gifts. Not just on Sunday, but 
during the week in all situations. And we pick up his words halfway through chapter 12, which is all about true spirituality and the use of our various God-given gifts. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptised by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. Now, continuing on from last week and what Paul said in the first half of this chapter about our gifts, here Paul goes on to essentially point out three things you ought to recognise. Between us, we have many gifts, many different diverse gifts, but we're all part of one group. Secondly, We all need one another. Our gifts are important to the whole. And thirdly, we're all equally important. Let's look at them more closely one at a time. First of all, we have many gifts, but we're all part of one group. So notice the word many here comes up three times in the opening three verses. As we saw last week, there are many gifts, and each of us have at least one. Many of us have more than one. Uh, Some of you are gifted in hospitality or cooking, others in encouragement. Some of you are very good at encouraging others. It's like it's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear of someone that needs encouragement. Uh, Some of you are very wise or knowledgeable, Uh, sometimes both. And not just because of your age, although age does bring knowledge and wisdom. Some of you are wise beyond your years and very knowledgeable of the world and the Bible. Others seem to have the gift of prayer. Praying comes very naturally to you. You You're gifted with uh, being not only able to pray, but You want to pray all the time. Uh, Some of us find prayer very difficult. A number of you are clearly gifted in serving in various ways. You're the first person to volunteer when we have a rotor out. 
Some of you are clearly gifted teachers to young people, something I'm certainly not gifted in. Some of you are very gifted in able to teach teenagers or young adults or even all adults. I think some of you are potentially gifted in this area, uh, preachers in the waiting, teachers in the waiting. And clearly at the Boathouse, some of you have the gift of music and, well, others clearly don't have the gift of music. Uh, One or two of us have great gifts in computers and the internet and programming and filming and photography, art and graphics and all those other things. Others have gifts in leadership and so on. There are many different gifts. But the main point here is that we're all part of the one group, one family, one body. Now we've seen how many times the word many comes up, but look how many times the word one comes up twice as many times. What Corinthian culture was doing to the Corinthians, in fact what all secular culture does to all people, is that it blinds you often into individualism. You think of yourself, you're told, you're taught to look after yourself, you're number one, you're the most important thing in the world. What matters most in your life is your job, your career, your income, bank balance, uh, your goals, your ambitions, uh, your bucket list. And you ought to use your gifts, your talents, your skills, your abilities for those things to build up your kingdom. But the gospel inverts that. So that when you become a Christian, you start seeing yourself in a different light and you start seeing others in a different light. You well ought to realise that you're part of one family, one people, with one father, with one head, one body, working for a common good. Christianity crushes the individualism that we have. Not the individual, but individualism that we are all bent on having, as our culture often teaches us. Christians sees themselves as part of a great big family or body of people. Paul uses the analogy of one body with many parts. Yes, there are different people, different roles, different gifts, different functions. We're of different ages, different backgrounds, uh, different cultures in the past and present. But as Christians, we're all part of the one, the one body. Yes, there are the individual parts, Paul says. There's the ear, there's the eye, the nose, and so on. But we're all part of the one body, a body that God has put together. That's the attitude adjustment we're all to have as Christians. At church on Sunday and during the week, it's something you have 24-7, seeing yourself as part of the whole. Christianity is a team sport, not an individual one. The gospel changes your attitude to people, church, the world, yourself. It changes your attitude to work and family, your money, and your time, and your use of gifts, as you start to see the bigger picture of being part of one body. But secondly... Uh, The all-important thing here is that Paul is telling us we all need one another. This comes out clearly, most of all, in verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Now, it's a fairly straightforward analogy. Different body parts needing each other. But I believe that the Corinthian mind would have been particularly understanding of Paul's point here. You see, for many years, centuries even, Corinth hosted the Isthmian Games. They were a big deal, just like the Olympic Games of their close cousins and neighbours, the Athenians. The Isthmian Games were held biannually in Corinth and included events like chariot races, fighting, boxing and wrestling, archery and running contests. The Corinthians knew, perhaps more than most, how important the eye was to the hand, 
or the foot was, to the torso. Likewise, we need each other. Certainly if we're going to function as a unit, your gifts being used on Sunday or throughout the week for the body of Christ, that is the church, are all needed. I'm not particularly gifted in finances and maths, but some of you are, and we need you to sort out our finances and keep us on track of our spending and giving and so on. And you are very important to the function of us as a church. We couldn't function without those of you who help with creche and teaching our kids. We need musicians, house group leaders, babysitters for during the week, uh, those who help with food rotors for your parents who have, have newborns. Uh, those who have skills, gifts in administration, those of you who are gifted as encouragers. We need you all to function properly. A great example for us at the Boathouse has been over the last couple of weeks. Look what we managed to achieve when we worked together in lockdown. Even though we were separate, we came together and made a music video with Craig at the helm and Laura and Karen and Alex singing the main parts. But many of us sang the all-important Hayes and Hoes. Most of us out of time, but because others were gifted in editing, we could fix that. And now the video has gone viral. Well, a couple of hundred hits anyway. And it's not just about the boathouse and what we can achieve under our roof, so to speak but being part of the full body of Christ, that is the worldwide church. Some of you are involved in Christian charities. Some of you directly support missionaries, give to our Latifa fund. Some of you are praying for the persecuted churches in the third world or the Middle East. All these organisations cannot survive without your help, without our help. Christians realising that they are part of a big body that is sustained by each one of us. We all need each other. Take, for example, the submarine. All people in the submarine are needed. Uh, they might have different roles, but they're all needed. There are deep sea navigators, those that flood the torpedo tubes, medics, sonar technicians, the captain, the chef, communication specialists, and so on. Uh, the submarine in the picture here seems to only have two people in it, but I think you get the point. The sub can only set sail and work, function properly, because all are needed and all doing their jobs. And the same with church. We need all of you to use your gifts so that we sail smoothly. We all need one another. Thirdly and lastly, therefore, we're all equally important. We may have different roles, different gifts, but in terms of who we are, we're all equally important. Paul continues to use the illustration of a body reading from halfway through to verse 24, but God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. That is because we're all equally important. Everyone matters. If someone suffers in our church, we all feel it. We all suffer. If someone is honoured with a reward or something like that, we all rejoice with them. Now, there is a ranking of gifts. Just like in the Navy on a submarine, there are different ranks. Paul gets into the grading or order of gifts and positions in the church at the end of this chapter and fleshes it out in particular in chapter 14. So we'll get to Paul's ranking of the gifts in the weeks to come. But the point now is that we're all equally important as people. 
And hence, we should have equal concern for one another, no matter what our gifts are. To use another submarine analogy, on the morning of the 23rd of May, 1939, the USS submarine Squalus was taking part in some naval exercises when one of her main air induction valves failed. Water came in and flooded both engine rooms till about a third of the hull was consumed by water. This caused the sub to sink to the bottom of the sea, bottoming out at about 240 feet, that is about 70 metres or so. The crew acted swiftly to prevent all the compartments from flooding. However, sadly, 26 of the crew died, but thankfully 33 of them survived. However, with little oxygen on board, the remaining men only had a window of a few days to survive. Uh, The crew managed to radio uh, to the ships around them involved in the uh, exercise drills that they were in trouble and had sunk to the bottom. Uh, Within a relatively short time, a rescue team arrived and got to work on saving the survivors. And they did. They saved all 33 men. No such uh, rescue had ever been achieved. It was a world record at the time. But here's the point. After sending the initial divers down to rescue those 33 men, they sent a rescue chamber, christened the bell, to get each man out one at a time. But as each sailor entered the bell, there was no question about what rank they were or what role they had to play. Everyone in the rescue team talked about 33 souls or 33 men, but not their different ranks. Incidentally, it was the same with the 26 who died. I came across this website in honour of those who lost their lives and lifted the list out for us to see today. Do note that it contains their names, but not their rank. No matter what your gifts, your roles are in church, in the body of Christ worldwide, you all equally matter. You're all equally important in the body of Christ, whether you're preaching or welcoming, whether you're in creche or in the music team, whether you're dropping a meal off to the parents of a newborn or speaking at a conference to thousands of people overseas whether you're mixing the latest video we've made or you're sitting on a board as a trustee of a charity. You all equally matter to God. And this ought to do three things, at least. Number one, first of all, it ought to encourage those of you who feel that you're not important. You feel on the margins, on the fringe of things. You feel irrelevant or that your gifts don't count or matter. You think just the little things you do for the body of Christ aren't really important. Well, in terms of rank, they mightn't be as important as some other things, but you are important. And what you're doing helps the whole body. Secondly, it ought to humble those of us who think we're important. Our roles might be important, but we're no more important than anyone else. So we mustn't feel that we should look down on people in a lowly way, uh, boost ourselves up with pride because of our gifts and our roles. And thirdly, I really do believe that this passage should encourage those of you who aren't really involved yet at the boathouse. Please see that you have gifts, perhaps many, and they can be used. We're sad that your gifts have been benched, whether that's our fault or your fault or a combination, but we can use you. We have 10 areas of ministry at the boathouse, and there's something in there for everyone to make the most of your gifts, to, for you to be involved in, for you to help us make these 10 areas of ministry really work. Please do not think that you're not important or you don't have anything to give. 
every one of us is important. You all matter. So the second half of this chapter is reminding us of three important things. We have many gifts. There's many different things that we are gifted in. But we're all part of the one group, that is the body of Christ. Secondly, we all need one another. We're all dependent on one another so that the body functions correctly. And we're all equally important. There may be a rank to our gifts, but each person is just as important as the other. So I hope this helps you see the way God sees things, that it's opened your eyes to the wonderful truths about our gifts, how we use them for one another, and for God in his service. God bless.